Hi, I'm Lisa Wimberger and I'm the founder of the Neurosculpting Institute. And the Neurosculpting modality is unique in that it takes some of my favorite aspects of meditation and mindfulness and combines it with a structure that takes the brain science into account. Our brains really like to learn in a very specific way. And until we're aware and cognizant of what that process is, then we can't meditate or create new stories for ourselves in a very strategic way. It's kind of like being a salmon swimming upstream. So the process hinges upon um, a key component of neuroplasticity, which is if you pay focused attention to an experience, you will learn or map that experience into your neurology, into a neurological um, excitation that you can store as a memory and then retrieve later to repeat it. So take for instance learning how to ride a bicycle. When you're a child and you're learning how to ride a bike, you're paying full attention. You're not multitasking. You're not trying to color in your coloring book at the same time. You're paying full heightened attention to the experience. And then because you've done so, you store that learned moment into your brain so that tomorrow you can retrieve it and start from where you left off. And this is how we learn and we build upon our skills. Now to do this, we have to be paying attention. And what does paying attention look like? It looks like to the brain, the front of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, activating, getting all excited, having a flood of neurotransmitter harmony, having a flood of fuel and resources so that I can direct my attention and um, quiet distractions. That's what paying attention looks like, and that's what the brain is doing. Now, we can pay attention in a couple different ways. We can pay attention through fear, which is a great way to snap into the moment and pay attention. If I'm afraid and I get a real good jolt of fear, I will pay such attention to that moment, I will likely never forget it. Consider this story. Little girl, five years old, me. I'm going on my very first camping trip. I'm so excited. This is, this is a day of firsts. I'm paying full attention. New sleeping bag, vacation with my family, the smell of the leaves, my first campfire, my first roasted marshmallow. So my attention centers are fully engaged. And now it's time to go to bed. And I crawl into my sleeping bag and I lay my head down and all of a sudden I lay it down on a spider and there's a spider on my cheek and I start crying and screaming and I jump out of bed and I'm flicking off the spider and my parents try to console me. I have now taken a moment of fear, a charge of emotion, and I have taken everything I paid attention to in that close time frame and I've mapped that all to fear. And I'll store that memory for a very long time. In fact, 10, 15 years later when I'm a teenager and I'm going camping, what's the first thing I'm likely to do when I get in my sleeping bag? I'm going to look for a spider. That moment is mapped so indelibly into my hippocampus that I can retrieve it at a moment's notice without provocation and engage with it as though it's still real. That's one way we map. Another way we map is through novelty. So for instance, if we're talking to each other in a classroom and suddenly a very tiny purple miniature elephant stumbles into the center of the room, he's about this big and he sneezes, a cute little sneeze out of his nose, what are you gonna remember about our conversation? You're going to remember the elephant because that moment of novelty and curiosity drew your attention away from what I was saying and recruited your attention centers to focus on the elephant. So if we can map to fear, or we can map to novelty, then wouldn't it be in our best interest to find those moments where we could choose to focus on novelty rather than fear, so we can store those memories in a kinder, more gentle way for our body. So consider this, if I could remap that memory of the spider, and I could not be so threatened by it. Maybe I could not be in fear the next time I go camping. And maybe I could start focusing on some other things and not re-traumatize myself each time.
And the way this happens is this. In the center of our brain, in our temporal lobe, we have housed what we call the fight or flight center. Thank goodness we have a fight or flight center because its job is to cause us to run really fast when we're hiking in the woods and we, and we come up against a bear or some predator and we're shocked. And before we have time to empathize or think about it, the fight or flight center says, go now. And um, so this has to be pre-conscious in order to keep us alive. But because it's so fast and because it can get information from all different parts of the brain and process that information in a parallel manner simultaneously, it becomes easily dominant. If it's that efficient and that honed and can process multiple sensory inputs simultaneously, it's going to take over when we don't want it to. And this is very common. So you might have this experience where you have one experience that is charged with fear or a negative emotion. And then going forward, any other experiences you have that are similar to that, you might pull up that same fear. And you may really limit yourself in that new moment because you're referencing it against a past moment. Then there's the prefrontal cortex, which is in the front of the brain, and it's an energy hog. It is using 20, 25% of our whole brain's resources. The glucose, the oxygen. Think of this. The brain is three pounds, dry weight, roughly. Uses roughly 30% of our body's fuel. And of that, 25% of that fuel is used by the prefrontal cortex. What that means is this. To function in our prefrontal cortex, we consume a lot of fuel. Now, what is the prefrontal cortex good for? Well, it's our executive director. It makes executive decisions around what we're experiencing in the world. And most recently, it's been correlated to those moments where we feel compassion and empathy and big picture thinking and, and joy and expansion and the sense that there's something more going on than just us and our ability to read and write. So the prefrontal cortex is very handy in making us uniquely human, yet it's an energy hog and exhausts very easily. The prefrontal cortex and the limbic brain do a dance, a seesaw relationship. So when the limbic brain that fight or flight center is using fuel, it's quieting the prefrontal cortex. So things like compassion and forgiveness are not accessible to us. And conversely, when the prefrontal cortex is active, it's using the fuel and down-regulating that fight or flight center. So when we're in forgiveness and compassion and love, we're not reactionary. So to get these two parts of our brain to communicate and play nice, is the goal of neurosculpting. And so what the process does is it involves first quieting that fight or flight center the best we can. Not completely, but the best we can in that moment. And that really happens in the induction part of the neurosculpting process. Through breathing, through focusing on safe, repetitive, predictable things happening in the environment and in our body. And quieting that so we are understanding that we're safe. From there, the next part of the induction in the, in the exercise is to tease the prefrontal cortex into paying attention, focusing that into this area and that area and drawing the attention, and we do that in the induction, and you'll experience that in just a little bit. From there, we tell a story, and in the storytelling, the story helps us script a new script or relate to an old fear in a new way. But it does so when the brain is primed to pay attention to that story and not retrieve the fear. So in the storytelling, what the facilitator will do with you is help you alternate your analytical desire with your experiential desire through the way we use language. And the story will feel very simple to you. And then at the end, the facilitator will give you all sorts of cues and triggers that you can use in your day-to-day -to, -day to remember the experience you had. And you may also talk a little bit about food 
and diet support to help your fight or flight centers stay quiet and your prefrontal cortex stay excited. And in this process that you're about to go through, you'll learn some valuable skills to start navigating your world very, very differently. As your facilitator takes you through these exercises, just be open to having your own brand new experience and don't be afraid to reach out to us at the Neurosculpting Institute. We'll be happy to answer more of your questions.